Following the end of World War II, the Japanese-occupied territory of Korea was divided between the USA and the USSR. After attempts to unify the country during the late 1940s failed, tension began to build along the 38th parallel. This was primarily due to the reluctance of the Soviets to take any part in unification proceedings. An Iron Curtain fell between North and South Korea. In 1948, the Americans sponsored the formation of the Republic of Korea in the region south of the 38th parallel. At the same time, the Soviets sponsored the formation of the Korean People's Democratic Republic in the North, both sides claiming to be the legitimate government of Korea. The regime in the North immediately set about to bring down the South Korean government through subversive activities, propaganda, and as time went on, more violent and threatening methods. In June 1950, the North Korean government presented two proposals for the amalgamation of the North and South Korean assemblies. These two proposals were biased toward the North and rejected outright by the South. On the 25th of June, five days after the rejection of the second proposal, the North Korean People's Army launched offensives along the border. The Korean War had begun. On that same morning, 77 Squadron Sergeant's Mess received a telephone call from the operations officer, United States 5th Air Force, to the effect that North Korea had attacked South Korea and warning that the squadron may be called upon to help do something about it. Two days later, the United Nations Security Council met and declared that the North Korean action constituted a breach of the peace and called on member nations for assistance. The Australian government advised 77 Squadron on the last day of June that it was to assist in policing Korea under the command of the US 5th Air Force. Thus, 77 Squadron was to have the distinction of being the first Commonwealth unit to participate in the conflict. officer of 77th Squadron is quiet, efficient Wing Commander Lou Spence, DFC. Each morning he says so long to his wife and children and like millions of civilians leaves for the office which happens to be the Korean front line. When he says he's had a hard day at the office his wife believes him. In operations room intelligence deals out the gen for the day's strike. Interest is in the Taegu bulge where North Koreans are making an all-out effort to capture the city and vital airstrip. They will strike at the enemy within five miles of the Strip. 77 Squadron flew its first mission of the Korean War on the 2nd of July 1950, providing air cover for the United States Air Force C-47 transports evacuating wounded back to Japan. The second mission consisted of six pilots, led by Flight Lieutenant Stuart Brick Bradford, as they escorted USAF B-29s on a mission to bomb the airfield at Ham Hung in North Korea a sortie of almost six hours. We had to escort um, 12 B-29s who were going to bomb an airfield at Ham Hung, which is up on the Russian Manchurian border. So we six got airborne and flew out over the straits between Korea and Japan, met these B-29s and then flew with them, escorted them all the way up the coast, right up to Ham Hung and did the bombing raid over Ham Hung. And, uh, Heavy, heavy anti-aircraft, and these these people, I really I admire them. They they all in close formation, start bursting all around them. They flew out of the airfield and started dropping their bombs, and their bombs started inside the airfield perimeter, went right down the runway and stopped inside the perimeter and didn't hit anything else at all. That was the idea of it, which was incredible stuff. And then came back out again, and we followed them all around, and we got shot out quite violently on the way out. And then we started to fly back down south again. Down south again, we got attacked by two yaks, piston engine Russian aeroplane, but only, it, only made one pass of the first B-29 who fired back and never saw them again. Then on the way, on the way back down, they called up and said they had, had identified a submarine somewhere on the, on the coast. Could we identify, have a look for it? So one B-29 and two Mustangs left, went down, low level and flew on the coast for about an hour, couldn't find anything at all and linked up with them again. And then when we got down the bottom end of the straits between Korea and Japan, they headed off once again back, they'll go back to Okinawa, and we came back and landed back at Iwakuni, 
we were Air Force, airborne for over six hours, and they were airborne for 12 hours. That was our first, the first mission. This task of escorting transports and bombers was soon discontinued due to an almost total lack of North Korean air activity. The squadron's first ground attack mission was flown on the 3rd of July 1950 when eight Mustangs, led by Wing Commander Lou Spence, attacked targets on the road between Haitaku and Suwon. The squadron destroyed two locomotives, one truck, six other vehicles, and damaged a bridge. Prior to the mission, the CO had misgivings about the target area being in North Korean hands. He rechecked the details with the 5th Air Force Control Center at Itazuke, only to be assured that it was a definite North Korean target. However, when the squadron reached the area, one of the locomotives was seen to carry South Korean markings. Flight Lieutenant John Bay Adams radioed to an American forward air control aircraft further south and was assured that the area was in enemy hands. The flight then proceeded to destroy the targets. However, after the pilots returned and were relaxing, the sickening news arrived that the trucks had been carrying South Korean and American troops of an advanced battalion. General Partridge, commander of the 5th Air Force, called personally to apologize, and the commanding general of the Far Eastern Air Forces, General Stratemeyer, also apologized. It was clear that 77 Squadron was blameless. The event, however, did have a salutary effect on the US system of target allocation. The squadron suffered its first casualty on the 7th of July, 1950, when squadron leader Graham Strout failed to return from an attack on targets of opportunity along the north coast of Korea. It was assumed he had been shot down by ground fire. Because of the vast distances between the RAAF station at Iwakuni in Japan and targets in North Korea, it became necessary to stage aircraft through the Korean airstrip of Taegu. The Mustangs would depart Iwakuni each morning attack their allotted targets, and land at Taegu for refueling and rearming. This arrangement also made it possible to mount a further attack on the North Koreans before the aircraft returned to Iwakuni. During the first month of fighting, the squadron flew a total of 1,337 flying hours and suffered the loss of one Mustang and pilot. Keith Meggs describes a typical sortie. Going up looking for a road that there might have been trucks or um, even... Uh, what do you call it, carts driven by horses or um, cattle. We knew that they were coming down with rifles and ammunition, but uh, anything that we saw that we thought was feeding to the North Koreans before they got driven across the 38th parallel. So we were looking for those with rockets. We had uh, you know, six rockets and perhaps two 500-pound bombs under the wings of the Mustang, plus 1,880 rounds of 0.5 ammunition. So whatever target came up, he'd use what was appropriate. So if he saw tanks, he'd fire rockets at them, try and dismantle them, you might say. If he saw a train, you might um, drop bombs on it, or a tunnel with a train in it. Anything at all trucks coming down the highway, eventually it got to the stage where the highways move, moving down to the south were all given um, recognition and two aircraft would go up along say 100 miles of those looking for any movements. But if there was nothing there you could bomb a bridge or a railway line to uh, discourage anything coming down. The war had not been going well for UN forces as the communists continued to advance south. By the end of July 1950, UN forces had been pushed back to an area south of the Naktong River near the town of Pusan, and there was a desperate struggle to hold the town. In that same month, the hard work of 77 Squadron was acknowledged, and they were awarded the coveted Duke of Gloucester Cup, an annual award for the most efficient RAAF squadron. The squadron's Mustangs worked with ground controllers who guided the pilots onto enemy positions. The controllers were situated close to the enemy front line to ensure accuracy. Often, the ground controller would be out of view of the enemy. In this situation, an air controller flying a light aircraft, such as an Oster, would be used to direct the Mustangs onto the target. As well as flying close support missions, the Mustangs of 77 Squadron were also directed to attack the enemy lines of supply and communication. 
It was hoped that by destroying these vital targets, the enemy would be sufficiently weakened, enabling the UN forces under siege at Pusan to break out. To achieve this, Mustangs carried out attacks on railways, bridges, roads and supply dumps during August. The enemy often used railway tunnels to hide trains and equipment from air attack. The tunnels drew repeated attacks from the rocket-armed Mustangs. On the 9th of August 1950, during an attack on a town suspected of harboring enemy troops, Stan Williamson was hit by anti-aircraft fire. Williamson found that he could not lower his flaps for landing and crash-landed his aircraft at Pohang. He was fortunate to walk away uninjured, although his aircraft was written off. On the 22nd of August, the squadron's CO, Wing Commander Spence, was awarded the American Legion of Merit for outstanding leadership, devotion to duty, and great personal courage. The decoration was the first to be awarded to a member of the squadron in the Korean conflict. September began tragically when, on the 3rd, William Billy Harrop crashed five miles from Taegu. Harrop had been part of a four-aircraft formation providing cover for USAF B-29 bombers attacking the North Korean coastal town of Pyongyang. On the 9th of September, worse was to come when four Mustangs led by the CO attacked the town of Angangni with rockets and machine guns. The weather was bad with low cloud creating poor visibility and hazardous flying conditions. The CO, Wing Commander Spence, was seen to commence a steep attacking dive from 700 feet onto the target when he was apparently struck by ground fire and crashed into the ground. He was killed instantly. But he dived in with his wingman over a target called Angang Ni, and somewhere along the down the line he was hit. Well, see, it only takes one round, one round to hit a pilot, and uh, depending on how many people were firing at him, well, he didn't recover. He just kept on diving, hit the ground, and they uh, they went in later on uh, an army, not an army, an air force padre, and actually found the wreck and and uh, the remains but he was obviously hit by ground fire. A, a, a terrible further depression over everybody. And we had luckily had blokes like Bay Adams, who was a, an old wartime pilot who'd been through it before, and he was managed to you know, boost us up again and say, you know, it's, that's what it's all about, that's for real, so I just got to face up to it, which we did. And, and, and uh, you start to accept losses in as part of way of life. On the 15th of September, in an attempt to split the enemy forces in two, General MacArthur landed the 10th US Marine Corps at Incheon near Seoul. Caught between this force and the US 8th Army fighting its way up from Pusan, the North Koreans were at last put on the defensive. The UN forces recaptured the South Korean capital of Seoul, and a concerted effort to push the enemy back to the Manchurian border now began. The squadron operations gradually moved north with the advancing ground forces. The squadron's aircraft repeatedly struck at the enemy supply lines and communications, in particular the North Korean rail system, which commanded special attention. The ground forces moved swiftly, and by the end of the month, 77 squadron Mustangs were roaming deep into North Korea. By the end of September 1950, UN forces crossed the 38th parallel. It was decided that 77 Squadron would move from Iwakuni to a Korean airfield from which the Mustangs could strike at North Korean targets without having to transit long distances. On the 12th of October, the squadron relocated to Pohang, known as Airfield K-3, situated on the east coast of South Korea, and began operations against the enemy the next day. Three moves over in Korea. Uh, the first one was to Pohang, down on the southeast side of the coast. Then it was up to a place that usually is called Ham Hung, but the city's up in North Korea. And in fact, the base was at Yon Po, but up north in Ham Hung, uh, to be closer to the scene of operation, because by this time, the Allied forces had driven the North Koreans up back, and this was past the 38th parallel, the old border. But that didn't last long at all, because then the Chinese came into the war, and uh, very soon we got deeply involved, our squadron, in defending the Allied forces up in North Korea who were being driven back by very big Chinese forces. 
And it was that stage that the MiG-15 started to come into the war and so on. Although we didn't see them from our Mustangs. Uh, the Americans with their Sabres were a little bit involved with MiG-15s. But we only lasted there a few weeks and were driven right back, well, not necessarily driven, but we did evacuate right back south to a place called Taigu, right on the southern border of uh, Korea. So we had those three changes there. On the 19th of October, four Mustangs, led by squadron leader Cresswell, set out from Pohang to attack targets close to the North Korean capital of Pyongyang. They attacked an enemy position, holding up the UN advance, as well as destroying a train to the north of Pyongyang. The North Korean capital was captured on the 19th of October by the advancing UN forces as they pushed towards the Yalu River, which forms the border between Korea and Manchuria. On the 20th of October, number 91 wing was formed at Iwakuni and became operational on the 1st of November 1950, which included 77 fighter squadron. The wing was placed under the operational control of the Commander-in-Chief United Nations Korea and the administrative control of the Commander-in-Chief British Commonwealth Occupation Force. To keep as close to the front lines as possible, on the 16th of November 1950, the squadron moved north to airfield K-27 at Yonpo near Ham Hung. The move was supported by C-119 transport aircraft of the USAF. The Chinese and North Korean forces now started to push the UN forces south. The squadron's Mustangs attacked the enemy transports and flew in close support of the embattled UN forces. For the first time since the start of the conflict, 77 Squadron was called upon to support Australian troops who were making a counter-attack against Chinese forces at Park Hon. The Squadron's Mustangs flew constant attacks against swarms of enemy tanks and vehicles as they moved along the roads leading from Manchuria, inflicting heavy casualties. On the 24th of November, General MacArthur ordered the UN forces onto the offensive, but the situation was hopeless. On 24 November, the 8th Army launches its all-out assault. Forward elements of the Marines reach Udam. Suddenly and without warning, the Chinese attack. They check the 8th Army advance and block the 10th Corps at Udam. But the 8th Army's right flank receives the heaviest blow. It disintegrates, and Chinese sweep south in overwhelming numbers. Elements of the 3rd deploy... The 1st Division of U.S. Marines found themselves surrounded by seven enemy divisions, and for the first time in their history were as their general put it, ordered to advance in another direction. As the UN ground forces retreated to South Korea, all available aircraft moved to the airfield at Yonpo, inside the Hamhung Hungnam defense perimeter. At Yonpo, tension mounted as the enemy advanced ever closer to the airfield. All personnel were ordered to carry firearms and to prepare to defend the base. Bad weather was hampering operations at snowbound Yonpo, and the ground crews worked ceaselessly in sub-Arctic conditions to keep Mustangs airworthy. Finally, word was received to abandon the airfield. The airfield K-9 at Pusan was known locally as Dogpatch, but senior Far East Air Force officers renamed it Unityville to reflect the spirit of UN purpose. The squadron continued to hit enemy targets, and provide reconnaissance missions through to the new year, and lost their sixth pilot, Sergeant Donald Ellis, in December, when he was shot down by ground fire on a reconnaissance mission near Pyongyang. On the 4th of January 1951, the Chinese armies captured Seoul, which had now changed hands for the third time. Two days later, the squadron suffered a further casualty when Sergeant Jeffrey Stevens crashed on flat ground near Munsan during an armed reconnaissance sortie. Then, on the 19th, the squadron was ordered to attack the Chinese Communist Forces headquarters in Pyongyang and would fly the mission as a complete squadron of 12 Mustangs. Uh, we had occasion to target a Chinese Communist headquarters in Pyongyang when we were operating from way down South Korea. And uh, the operation was to comprise 77 squadron going in with, uh, with 16 aircraft, 16 uh, Mustangs, and the USAF coming over was uh, B-29 bombers. Now, they were supposed to come through, if I remember rightly, about 20 seconds before we came in. Our 
and, and they, they would saturate the target and give us a pretty clear go at this headquarters. And, and, and over Pyongyang, there was flat like you wouldn't believe. We had eight airplane doing bombing and eight airplanes doing uh, uh, rockets and bombing and eight doing rockets and napalm. I was a napalmer. Bombers, bombers went in first. As they were going in, they're flying through hundreds and hundreds of bloody bombs being dropped by B-29s who are 20 seconds late. And, uh, you know, th 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 this is... When I say plus or minus five seconds, this is what we're talking about. And I'll give you another example later of the absolute incredible, that, you know, the, 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 the necessity for timing. So we went in, uh, or the bombers went in. They did a pretty good job, or the rocketing and, 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 and uh, the bombers going in at about 60 degree angle and therefore a, a little more difficult as a target to the, to the ground uh, flak people. We went in with our napalm, and that's about a 15 degree angle, and you're really setting yourself up for, for my, my, my leader got, got shot down actually there, Gordon Harvey. I lost my number two, it was a black called Gordon Harvey. He spent 13 months as the guest of the Chinese as POW. Um, we were doing a big raid on um, Pyongyang, on the so-called headquarters. Gordon got shot up, and Forced land on a icebound strip, uh, strip no, island, middle of the Han River, and he was captured. Um, but the Yanks said, if you can find him next morning, you can have control of my whole air force. They laid on a carrier, they sent a carrier up the west coast, loaded the two three helicopters. Um, in the operation order that, that day they gave me a, a special uh, call sign and if my call sign went out that I needed to help to get Gordon Harvey out the whole bit of force would be would turn in and help out the Yanks did that they were very amazing helped their friends we never got Gordon out of course we found uh, her photographs that he'd, he'd been captured and sent north Flight Lieutenant Gordon Harvey had executed a successful wheels-up landing on an island in the frozen Taidong River, northwest of the North Korean capital, before being taken prisoner. The first squadron pilot to fly 100 missions, he spent the rest of the war in appalling conditions in a Chinese POW camp. He was released on the 28th of August, 1953. He later commanded 77 Squadron in Malaya, flying Avon Sabre fighters. In mid-January, the UN retreat ended 25 miles south of Seoul, then began a slow push north to recapture the South Korean capital. During the push, 77 Squadron lost another three pilots during operations. By the 15th of March 1951, Seoul had been retaken, and 77 Squadron continued to support the advancing troops and take a number of losses themselves. UN ground forces on all fronts are pushing slowly and methodically northward toward the 38th parallel. They meet only light resistance as the Chinese communists fall back. On 21 March, Chun Chon falls without a fight. In an attempt to speed up the offensive and trap the large enemy force guarding the approaches to Pyongyang, the 187th Regimental Combat Team parachutes behind enemy lines in the Munsan area, just 12 miles below the parallel. At the same time, other UN forces drive northward along a 15-mile front above Seoul to meet them. On the 23rd, the squadron participated in the largest parachute operation of the Korean War, Operation Tomahawk. 3,300 parachutists of the 187th Regimental Combat Team will participate in the operation. Into the C-119 flying boxcars, heavy equipment is loaded. 4.2-inch mortars, 105-millimeter howitzers, and jeeps are prepared for the drop to support the parachute infantrymen. Air Force crew members get last-minute briefings. Pilots carefully recheck jump areas on maps, get latest weather report, and then prepare to take off. Troop carrier planes rendezvous over Taegu and fly northward. 
Fighters and bombers have preceded these planes to soften up enemy resistance. Here's the jump area, 10 miles south of the parallel. At 0900 on Good Friday, 23 March, Brigadier General Frank S. Bowen's 187th Airborne RCT hits the silk over the rice paddies and rolling terrain of the jump area. The parachutists leave the troop carriers in sticks of 42 men from each plane at an altitude of 800 feet. As soon as all parachute personnel have jumped, the flying boxcars start delivering the heavy equipment. In this plane, jeeps and trailers are being dropped. A small parachute is released to aid in pulling the heavy cargo from the plane. More equipment and supplies are dropped as the parachutists quickly assemble and organize on the ground. The North Korean First Corps Eight Mustangs from the squadron escorted 120 USAF transport aircraft over the Munsani area. They then helped destroy any opposition from the enemy forces on the ground. UN forces finally crossed the 38th parallel for the second time on the last day of March. The last few months had taken quite a toll on the squadron. Accordingly, it was with some relief that, on the 4th of April, the squadron received the news that it was to withdraw to Iwakuni to begin converting onto the long-awaited Gloucester Meteor jet fighter. The squadron flew its last operational Mustang sortie on the 6th of April 1951, when four aircraft had to abort an attack on a North Korean road due to bad weather. Just north of Seoul, Allied planes smash Chinese columns massed for an attack a scant thousand yards beyond our main line of defense. Pouring down the historic invasion routes from Munsan and Weijongbu, the Reds try to break through to Seoul. Officers observe the effectiveness of UN air power back in the skies after days of rain as it plasters enemy concentrations building up for their much heralded May Day attack on Seoul. The planes smother the target with machine gun fire, rockets, and napalm. During the first few months of 1951, 77 Squadron continued to operate from Airfield K-9 at Pusan, South Korea. The UN forces had been successfully pushing the enemy north, back across the 38th parallel, which included the large parachute drop, Operation Tomahawk. At the same time, the RAAF were bringing in Gloucester Meteors to Japan for the squadron, a long-awaited and very welcome upgrade. Although the Meteor had been in the charge of the RAAF since May 1946, it was not until this year 1951, that Meteors entered regular service for Australia and through a true baptism of fire. On the 24th of February 1951, the light aircraft carrier HMS Warrior arrived off Iwakuni with 15 Gloucester Meteor Mark 8 jet fighters and two Meteor Mark 7 two-seat jet trainers on her deck. Four experienced Royal Air Force Meteor pilots, led by Flight Lieutenant Max Scannell, were attached to 77 Squadron to test fly the new aircraft and to convert the Australian pilots onto the aircraft. The first RAAF pilot to convert to the new jet was Squadron Leader Cresswell, who had completed a jet conversion course on the F-80 Shooting Star with the USAF during the previous January. I was OK because I'd, I'd flown with the Americans on the F-80, F the Shooting Star, um, a couple of months before. I had 10 missions on the Shooting Stars too. No, it was a very easy aircraft to convert to. And the RAF sent us out four very good instructors. And um, so we had no trouble. We had two jets, two uh, dual jets. We had no trouble converting the media. Not at all. 
It's a very easy aircraft to fly. We call it the gentleman's aircraft. Um, having two engines didn't make a difference. Being a jet didn't make much difference to blokes with experience. Um, some of the early guys had a bit of trouble. I had a form on what I called an orientation flight at uh, Iwakuni. And that flight was generally commanded by a retiring uh, a pilot from, from the squadron going south. I said, well, spend a fortnight there and teach some of these guys what goes on. That helped a hell of a lot. And, um, it meant that about the blokes coming from Australia with no meteor experience but had jet experience on vampires could get about uh, up to 20 hours in the meteor before they went into operations. That worked pretty well. During the period 20 April to 20 May, the communists launched two phases of their expected spring offensive. On 23 April, the Reds jump off on their first phase, hitting strongest above Seoul. UN troops are forced to withdraw south as British and Belgian contingents hold off the communists in a spectacular rearguard engagement. A secondary action of this phase hits in the Huachan Reservoir area. By 30 April, UN forces cease their withdrawal and set up the Lincoln Defense Line a few miles north of Seoul. In the central sector, UN troops withdraw south of the Pukhan River, and in the east, ROK forces pull back to Yangyang. From 1 May to 16 May, there is only minor enemy activity as the communists build up for the second phase and UN forces recover some ground north of Seoul. UN air forces strike at targets of opportunity. The second phase begins on 17 May with the heaviest attack in the central sector southwest of Inji and east of Chonchon. Heavy casualties are inflicted on the Reds in this area. On 20 May, the UN forces shorten their line north of Seoul, strengthen positions in the central sector, and move to plug a gap caused by the collapse of two ROK divisions. On the 5th of May, 77 Squadron's conversion to meteors began in earnest when a program of lectures got underway for both air and ground crew. Due to a lack of two-seat meteor trainers, the two aircraft the squadron did possess were forced to fly constantly to keep up with the hectic pace of the conversion course. By the 2nd of June 1951, the squadron was ordered back to Korea. However, the move was delayed because the USAF insisted that the meteors be fitted with a radio compass before being allowed to fly in Korea. Then, a freak accident left the squadron's engineering staff puzzled. On the 14th of June, Sergeant Tom Stoney had just taken off to conduct an acceptance test flight. A few minutes after takeoff, the ground crew observed Stoney descending by parachute with the meteor flying circles around him. The aircraft flew around him five times, at one stage coming to within 20 feet of him before crashing into a hillside. I remember once standing on the strip at uh, Iwakuni and during this conversion period, I think there was one particular aircraft up flying and something went wrong and the pilot was ejected through the, accidentally, we think was accidentally, in fact, I'm sure it was accidental, um, he, was, he was ejected and went straight through the canopy. And I was standing there looking up and I actually saw it happen and I saw the parachute open, the pilot was able to uh, uh, work his parachute and he was coming down quite normally and the aircraft looked like it was under control, under manual control and it was, and it, 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 was, it was descending in a perfect spiral around the pilot coming down like this, in a perfect spiral around the pilot like that. And, uh, that was rather unusual because um, I thought it was being manned. It, we, we had two different types of uh, meteors. One was the single-engine fighter and the other one was a, a twin-engine trainer. 
And I thought it must have been one of these twin engine trainers because it was being, you know, it, was, it looked as though it was under control. But it wasn't. It was just one of these rare sort of things that happened where the aircraft came down in a perfect spiral, descended in a perfect spiral, very, very close to the, um, to the pilot, all the way down to the ground. Stoney landed safely, but when quizzed about the reason for ejection, claimed that he had not ejected from the aircraft, but that the ejection seat had gone off on its own accord. One minute, he had been leisurely flying along, and a few seconds later, he had found himself hanging from his parachute. The seat was found a few miles from the main aircraft wreckage, but after careful inspection, no reason for the automatic ejection could be found. Allied units push northward along the entire front as the tide of battle changes decisively in Korea. A tank infantry force takes up the pursuit of the exhausted Reds who bogged down in the second stage of their unsuccessful spring drive. The enemy, who has suffered huge losses in men and materiel, is retreating toward North Korean mountain strongholds. Withdrawing along a front of more than 100 miles, Red units find themselves under constant attack from the well-organized UN troops. Enemy lines of supply and communication are placed under continuous aerial and artillery bombardment. By 20 May, the second phase of the Red Spring Offensive has been thrown back along the entire front, with the last gap closed on the Eastern Front near Hang Yi by 24 May. The UN counterattack is launched immediately, driving the communists in full retreat. By the beginning of June, the pursuit, spearheaded by armored columns, has carried the Allies across the 38th parallel into North Korea, where the enemy braces and halts their retreat, forming a defense triangle anchored at Chorwon, Kumwa, and Pyongyang. By 15 June, UN forces crack the heavy red defenses in their so-called Iron Triangle, taking Kumwa and Chorwon and advancing north to Pyongyang. During the week 13 to 20 June, the communist air power becomes more aggressive, but suffers heavy losses to the UN air arm. During this period, the line undergoes minor changes as the ground phase subsides to patrol action and sporadic encounters. By early July 1951, peace negotiations were underway at Kaesong, with UN negotiators traveling from their base at Munsan. Then, on the 21st, the communists called for a recess in the peace talks as they regrouped their armed forces just north of Kaesong. At the end of July 1951, the squadron returned to Korea and settled in at airfield K-14 at Kimpo, north of Seoul. The move was effected by C-47s of the RAAF 30th Transport Unit and C-119s and C-54s of the USAF. The area was a sea of mud as July was the middle of the Korean wet season and as a result, living conditions were very uncomfortable. The airfield was shared with the USAF 8th Fighter Wing, who were responsible for providing the Australians with meals and base facilities. The squadron flew its first operational jet mission on Sunday the 30th of July, when 16 meteors were tasked to carry out a fighter sweep in the vicinity of the Yalu River. At K-14, the squadron had to produce 18 operational aircraft each morning and evening, and as a result, the ground crews worked long hours to keep the 16 aircraft with two spares on line. Oh, I, I made a combat aircraft. I said, this is going to be a combat aircraft. We'll fly in company with the, the uh, American F-86s against the MiG-15. And uh, my idea is pretty sound. The Yanks liked the idea because it gave them some good support too. So there would be two squadrons of 16 aircraft over of American sabers and uh, 12 to 16 meteors behind them. Now, our rate of climb was better than the, the American saber. Um, and we also had four good guns, four cannons. But um, unfortunately, I left, I was posted um, oh, about three weeks after we introduced the meteor. 77 Squadron suffered its first casualties since converting to jet aircraft on the 22nd of August, when two aircraft collided when returning from a fighter sweep. Sergeant Reg Lamb, a Royal Air Force exchange pilot, and Sergeant Ronald Mitchell, 
were both killed eight miles north of Kimpo. When the Chinese entered the war with the MiG-15, the air superiority of the American-led forces changed dramatically. The MiG-15 had a performance equal to, and in some cases better, than the American Sabre at high altitude, although it had a tendency to enter a spin if not maneuvered carefully at medium altitudes. The first encounter 77 Squadron had with the MiG finally came on the 25th of August, when eight aircraft, providing cover for a USAF RF-80 reconnaissance jet, sighted four MiGs on patrol. Flight Lieutenant Scannell fired at one of the enemy jets at extreme range, but was unable to claim any hits. The MiGs flew back to safety across the Yalu River, where it was forbidden for UN aircraft to fly. Four days later, eight Meteors, led by squadron leader Dick Wilson, were on a routine fighter sweep. He had four aircraft down low, and I had four aircraft down low with him. And then we had eight aircraft flying above us, with the idea being if we were jumped, then they could come down on top of the MiGs. Well, the next thing Dick Wilson sees a couple of MiGs below him, so he called to, to our eight we, that we were going into attack. Well, as he turned over and started to dive in, I looked around and saw a whole bunch of MiGs sitting on the top of us, of all of us. And uh, as soon as he moved in on this other aircraft, the MiGs got onto him and they uh, caused quite a bit of damage to his aircraft. He was all right. I, when I saw them coming in, I then turned with my four onto, no, I had two, that's what we go born. Two of us, I t got two, one chap and myself, we turned in on the ones attacking Dick Wilson and told him to belt off because he was outnumbered to blow his. And we fired on those, and then uh, we broke off into another fight, which was there. Uh, and at one stage, I had a head-on attack with a MiG, which was quite interesting. Because they're, they're 37 millimetre cannons. Uh, the shell coming towards you is like an orange, bright orange. It's uh, 37 mils, about that big. You know, it's a fairly big old shell. Uh, the interesting thing was, at one stage during the fight, a meteor passed me, all in flames. Going down, I had a quick look at my map to see what the position was. And Dick Wilson saw a parachute going down. And whether he was on his way back, just as he turned, so he took a position on that. When we got back, the top flight didn't even know they'd lost a meteor. The Migs had snuck in, got their number four, um, and shot him down. That was Ron Guthrie, who became a prisoner of war. The interesting thing was the position that I had when I got back and the position that Dick Wilson had when he got back were both the same. Yet I saw the flaming aeroplane, <laughs> no parachute. He saw a parachute and no flaming aeroplane. So it shows you what you can see, you know, there's two people virtually in the same area of sky. Ron Guthrie became the unwilling creator of a number of world records. He became the first RAF pilot to escape from a jet fighter in combat using the ejection seat. This was one of the highest ejections ever experienced, just below 39,000 feet. The speed of ejection was Mach 0.84 and his descent, taking almost 30 minutes, were two other world records. Ron describes the moment he was hit. At this instant, I feel as though a load of bricks has fallen onto the rear end of my aircraft, which now shakes convulsively. Explosive shells from another MiG have destroyed my meteor's tail. My aircraft, at this stage merely an uncontrollable mass of MiG meat, begins to snap roll repeatedly. In shock, I prepare to make my first exit in a Martin Baker ejection seat at this great height and over enemy territory. I realize my guns are still firing and release the trigger. The vibrating instrument panel catches my attention, and two facts remain in my memory. The clock is reading six minutes past ten, and the Mach meter, my gauge of speed, registers 0.84. As the speed of the dive increases beyond 84% of the speed of sound, the aircraft shudders in compressibility. It continues to roll. 
It took Ron three attempts to get the ejection seat to fire. He then lost consciousness momentarily. When consciousness returned, he was in a surreal and freezing world, 39,000 feet above a rugged, snow-covered landscape. Squadron leader Dick Wilson had another lucky escape on the 9th of September when a 20mm armor-piercing round hit his cockpit during an attack on ground targets near Pyongyang. The round had entered the cockpit just below the windscreen before breaking up, injuring Wilson in the arm and shoulder. On the 26th of September 1951, a formation of 12 meteors were attacked by a large number of MiGs, diving through the Australian formation and scoring hits on one of the meteors before the pilot had a chance to break. The MiGs bugged out over the Yalu River, but not before Flight Lieutenant Ralph Dawson managed to fire two long bursts of cannon fire into one of the MiGs' wings. Several pilots claimed that they saw fuel streaming back from the MiG as Dawson's cannon rounds impacted into the enemy aircraft, the squadron's first successful jet combat claim. The, with the MiGs, they were basically being taught indoctrination that the pilots of MiGs were at a low level of training like we might have been at uh, Point Cook in Wurraways or at uh, Williamtown in Meteors learning the basics of air-to-air -air fighting which it was air-to-air -air combat um, with those aircraft up at a high level from 35, 40,000 feet. So they were being taught by somebody probably from, China, um, from Russia who'd been World War II combat pilots and they were teaching them what the tactics were. So finally, after perhaps a week of training backwards and forwards, showing what was required, either two or four would be broken away and led down by an instructor down through us and firing as they came down within range. But they'd keep on going. And we didn't have a hope in hell, as they say, of diving and following them. And we were, at that stage, up near the Yalu River, the Yalu River was the boundary between North Korea and Manchuria, where they were based. And General MacArthur wanted us to go across into Manchuria and attack their bases. You, we, we could actually see the aerodromes in Manchuria, but we weren't allowed to cross. President Truman said, no, we can't do that. We can't go across. So we were kept across that side. Russian MiG ace, Lieutenant Colonel Sergei Vishnyakov, recalled a dramatic encounter with Australia's 77 Squadron Meteors on the 1st of December, 1951. I opened fire and saw my shell bursts dancing all over the enemy aircraft. Its right engine flamed. I noticed the Meteor wingman's tail flying off as a result of the burst from my wingman. I saw another Meteor leaving the battle. We overtook him and attacked. I managed to frame him in my sights and opened fire. My shells burst on the Meteor's wings and the pilot bailed out. Not only were the Australians outnumbered many times over by the new Russian aircraft, they were outclassed by the new generation jet fighter. It was the skill and experience of the Australians that kept their losses as low as they were, as they managed best they could with their meteors, which were essentially World War II technology. Same thing, we were uh, patrolling at around about 33,000 feet, one lot at 33, one at 29, the Sabres were down around about 25, and the MiGs came up and uh, in great numbers, I think there were about 40 or something like that in the first encounter, and they just got a height advantage, came in and, uh, and, and blew us out. They, 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 we, we, we broke, but we had no manoeuvrability at that height, so we simply almost fell out of the sky. That's exaggerating it, but we, we were no match. The MiGs came over in great numbers, and we learned later that they were specifically targeting the meteors knowing that they were inferior in, in performance and that it would be not too good for morale one way or another. But they would come over in great numbers and we'd, 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 we'd engage in, in combat, lay with us, and there would always be generally four people, four guys staying up top. And they were obviously, well to us they, it seemed pretty obvious that they were Russians and that was confirmed later because there was an entire Russian group there. But they would wait until there was a straggler, in other words, a person who was not formed up with the main fight and not with his formation, and come down and four of them work him over and attack him. And we figured that they were Ruskies and, and, uh, 
and that they were pretty competent operators. It happened to me on one occasion. My wingman was shot up and forced out of the fight and I became the straggler. I was way out of the main fight on, on, this, uh, on this occasion. And uh, th these four guys came down and, and worked me over from about 33,000 feet right down to the deck. And they were doing, that. they were employing tactics that we certainly weren't capable of, 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 uh, of doing. Uh, they were very, very competent. They, they would attack uh, from, from a, a, a right rear quarter like that. And once I got my turn going in to, 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 to reduce their capability for deflection, there'd be one coming in from here because he's got a no deflection shot. I'd break into him and then there'd be one coming from above and I'd break into him and then one from... And this went on all the way. <laughs> I was pooped by the time I got to the deck, I tell you. I, I needed to pull 6G all the time because it was 6G at which we figured... The, uh, uh, the, their gun sight would no longer compute accurately and that was about the way it was with our gyro gun sight as well. So that went on right down to the deck and of course they couldn't, well I, I, was, I was amongst the trees, they couldn't stay with me anyway but, uh, uh, but purely on the count of fuel they had to bug out and get some height. Uh, in, in, in jets you need height to, uh, to get reasonable range from your fuel. So that was uh, that. That was the Ruskies and uh, the uh, you know the way they the way the way they operated. Well, I looked up one day. I saw, saw you could see them taking off from across the Yellow River, and we were just doing a sweep up and down inside our, on the outside side of the Yellow River, the borderline. See these fellas taking off, and I thought there's a few of them because they took a while to take off. In fact, <coughs> there were 64. Now, how I know this is that given time for them to get to their altitude and with aeroplanes that fly at a height like that, quite often they'll pull contrail, condensation trails. Their method was to fly in pairs, eight pairs, one behind the other, that's 68 to 16, and that was a train, what they called a train. And they were like eight carriages in pairs, making 16. They had four trains. There were 64. Now how I know for certain, was you just got a glance and you could see the contrails. Straight away, you, know, you can tell how many. This particular day, we had uh, 16. We had four four sections of four, 16 and 64 is 80. The Americans came up, they had two squadrons of 12, that's another 24. So you got all these aeroplanes in the sky and you never know, you know what's going to happen next. Uh, whether, somehow or other, uh, there was no collision, despite the fact we had all this aeroplane milling around in the sky. On the 1st of November 1951, the squadron was awarded a Korean Presidential Unit Citation for exceptionally meritorious service and heroism. Seven days later, an announcement was made that squadron leader Wilson had been awarded the British Distinguished Flying Cross. In an unfortunate incident on the 11th of November 1951, on returning from an aborted fighter sweep along MIG Alley, Sergeant Douglas Robertson suddenly broke formation and collided with flying officer Ken Blight. Robertson was killed when his aircraft crashed. Although Blight's meteor had lost four feet off the port wing and was almost unmanageable, he reached the base area by using full port engine power and applying full left rudder. However, the aircraft could not be controlled under 180 knots and Blight ejected. The aircraft crashed in a nearby paddy field, killing a young Korean farmer. 77 Squadron achieved its first confirmed MiG-15 kill on the 1st of December, when 12 meteors were engaged by over 50 MiGs in an epic dogfight over Pyongyang. In the opening attack, two meteors were damaged with one forced to return to Kimpo. Flying officer Bruce Gogoli latched onto the tail of a MiG, 
as his cannon fire sent pieces flying from the its fuselage and sending it crashing to the ground in a ball of flame. Several other Meteor pilots managed to hit another MiG, which was also sent crashing to the ground. Ten minutes into the fight, an order was given to break contact and head for home. Three Meteors were found to be missing. It is assumed that the pilots were taken by surprise as they turned for home. Two of the pilots were captured after ejecting, Sergeant Bruce Thompson and Sergeant Vance Drummond. The other pilot, Flight Sergeant Armit, was killed. The squadron had a MiG kill, but had paid a very high price. Here's the intelligence data for today's mission. This is mission 5102. Your call sign is Maple. Time over the target is 1240. You will provide cover for 16 F-84 fighter bombers, call sign Gel, attacking rail lines west of Changju at 1240. Other F-86 Sabres, call sign John, will cover 36 F-80 fighter bombers, call sign Midas, attacking the same target at 1315. Your escape and evasion procedures remain the same. We have a large and a small helicopter at each of these two islands, and an albatross flying boat will be orbiting over this island. If you should run into any trouble in the target area, pull out over the water, and they will be there to pick you up. Stand by for a timeline. In 15 seconds, it will be 1110. With the arrival of a second USAF Sabre Wing into the area, it was apparent that 77 Squadron's role would change. The air battle of the 1st of December, with the loss of three meteors, demonstrated the superiority of the Russian jets and that it would be foolish to continue using the meteor on fighter sweeps up MiG Alley. I didn't fly it when it was first issued to 77 Squadron. Um, it was when it went into aerial combat at the altitude, say 35,000 feet up on the Yalu, where they mixed it with the MiGs. Um, they took a pounding up there, really. We, we lost a couple of good fellows there and had a lot of aircraft shot down. Not going to say a lot, but quite a few shot down. One or two bailed out, taken prisoners of war. But it, it was uh, not uh, a good competitive high-altitude fighter compared to a MiG. Um, so for that reason, the, the MiG could outturn and, and meet you. It was faster, even though it didn't have the armour plating on it that uh, other aircraft had. In some cases, they didn't have radio, I believe. But it, the, 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 the meteor didn't compare to a MiG at high altitude as a pure interceptor fighter. But the Meteor was restricted after we took uh, a few losses and it was proved that it wasn't as good as the big and it was restricted to ground attack. And it was an excellent rocket platform. You could carry 16, 60 pound rockets on a Meteor. And uh, it had four Orlikon 20 mil cannons on it, which was good also in, in ground attack. So all the time I was there, the 49 missions I did, most of them were in ground attack and with rockets, napalm and high explosive. Not often we have to use the guns. We'd finished uh, truck strafing, road strafing, locomotive strafing. There wasn't much left on the ground to shoot at there in that respect with cannon, but there was still plenty to rocket in the way of army installations and assembly areas and all that sort of thing. So uh, the, the the intentions were good with the media, but they uh, they didn't it didn't live up to its expectations at altitude as an interceptor fighter. <clears throat> well, it as I said, it was a uh, a good platform. It uh, uh, it it was twin engine, uh, which gave it more reliability, and in ground attack you'd, you'd take a hell of a lot of shell fire and, uh, and small arms fire and all that sort of thing and, 
and it it would take a bit of battle damage a meteor would too, but it was a stable aircraft, and for for that reason, it, it you had time uh, to site up for rocket attacks, gun attacks, and all that sort of thing without the aircraft wandering around all over the sky. It, it as I said, it was a good stable platform. Uh, it was fast enough uh, for that sort of thing, and in and dive and out of the dive, you could get away pretty quickly. But it, 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 it would have been used at high altitude right through the war if it, it had just been that little bit better, that's all, but it wasn't as, as good as a MiG. In January 1952, the squadron was assigned the role of area and airfield defence for both Kimpo and Suwon, leaving the Sabres to patrol the skies over North Korea. In a ground attack role, the Meteor was able to find its niche in the Korean conflict. The squadron flew its first ground attack sortie on the 8th of January when four Meteors rocketed a water tower near a communist-held town. Ground attack missions required the Meteors to operate over hostile territory at low level. On the 27th of January, the squadron lost two pilots within an hour of each other as their Meteors attacked enemy positions in the Heiju area. In atrocious, snowy conditions, Flight Lieutenant Mark Brown Gaylord was hit by light flak of a strafing run, which knocked out his airspeed indicator and altimeter. The leader, Flight Lieutenant William Bennett, tried to inform Brown Gaylord of his correct height, but received no reply, and it is assumed that he crashed into the rugged terrain. Less than an hour later, Sergeant Bruce Gillen was hit by flak in the starboard wing while strafing an enemy water tower. Gillen probably ejected from his crippled jet, although no parachute was seen by his wingman, and it remains a mystery as to how he met his death. Accurate enemy anti-aircraft fire was becoming a major problem for the squadron pilots. On the 6th of February, anti-aircraft fire claimed another meteor flown by Flight Lieutenant John Hannon. A large search was launched as Hannon had been seen to parachute safely to the ground. On landing into white snow, he became invisible to the pilots overhead. Hannon was captured by the North Koreans and spent the rest of the war in a POW camp. One of the searching pilots, Flying Officer Richard Whitman, had a lucky escape when an enemy 25 caliber bullet passed through the aircraft seat without touching him. Another pilot, Sergeant Philip Zupp, was also called into the search. In the heavily defended area, Zupp made several low passes looking for Hannon when he thought that he'd caught a glimpse of a pilot's red marker scarf on the snow. He circled his meteor around at treetop height to investigate. His next memory was a deafening roar as his cockpit seemed to explode around him. With his canopy in pieces, the freezing 300-knot airflow startled him into evasive action. He heaved back on the control column as his meteor's ventral tank was now perilously close to the ground. Struggling to regain his orientation, he reached to straighten his oxygen mask and shattered goggles, his face now stinging from embedded perspex and shrapnel. He managed to nurse his meteor back to Kimpo, where he was treated for his wounds. Leaving the hospital later that day of his own volition, he was to fly two sorties the following morning. Ten days later, Sergeant Richard Robinson, who was flying his 38th mission with the squadron, crashed as a result of enemy ground fire whilst on a rocket mission. The meteor crashed without him being seen to eject. Late in 1951, the RAAF developed a new type of air-to-ground rocket containing napalm. It was known as the Flaming Onion. After trials at Williamtown and preliminary testing in Korea, the first weapons arrived in February 1952. The weapon was first put to the test on the 8th of February, when the squadron's new CO, Wing Commander Ron Susans, led four meteors armed with the new rocket in an attack on several buildings. The result was that 75% of the rockets scored hits on the targets resulting in numerous fires. The new weapon was to prove extremely useful against enemy vehicle convoys and troop concentrations, and it soon became the standard underwing weapon carried by RAAF meteors. Each aircraft was capable of carrying eight napalm rockets. During the next few months, the squadron continued to fly demanding ground attack missions, as well as area defense patrols. Unfortunately, two more pilots were lost during March, Sergeant Ian Cranston and Sergeant Lionel Cowper. Both failed to return from ground attack sorties. An indication of how hectic March was is shown in the squadron's operation sheets as 1,007 individual sorties were flown. On the 13th of April, Easter Sunday, Sergeant Max Colebrook was hit by enemy fire while strafing a suspected gun position. He radioed he was OK after jettisoning his ventral tank and was heading for home, but nothing more was heard or seen of him. 
On the 22nd of April 1952, Flight Lieutenant Ian Percy was hit by intense and accurate light automatic fire during a ground attack mission, and although the ejection seat was seen to leave the aircraft, nothing was seen of the parachute, and the aircraft crashed into the water south of the town of Chinampo. The Communist ground forces soon began to feel the effects of the continuous attacks on their supply lines. By early May, they began to send MiGs south in the hope of intercepting the raiders before they could reach their targets, so once more, the meteors were to clash with the MiGs. On the 4th of May 1952, a patrol of two meteors sighted a flight of nine MiG-15s southwest of Pyongyang. The MiGs immediately launched an attack, but on this occasion, the odds lay with the meteors as the MiGs were forced to fight at low altitude, thus negating their high altitude performance advantage. A MiG latched itself onto Sergeant Edward Meyer's tail, but was quickly shaken off, enabling his number two, Pilot Officer John Sermon, to fire two bursts of cannon fire into the MiG. The starboard tailplane and the starboard side of the MiG's exhaust port were seen to disintegrate in a flash of flame. Sermon was credited with probably having destroyed the aircraft, as neither Australian saw the MiG impact the ground. Four days later, in the same area, a flight of four meteors were intercepted by two MiGs. Once again, the meteors had a height advantage. This enabled pilot officer Bill Simmons to make a firing pass on one of the enemy jets. The MiG entered an uncontrollable spin, and the pilot was seen to bail out. This was the squadron's ninth MiG claim. Our formation was flying probably several, several thousand feet uh, below the Americans, and um, the first, uh, first indication I had of, uh, uh, of um, any real danger was uh, when I observed um, uh, three distinct uh, lines of uh, tracer ammunition going over my uh, left wing. Um, instinctively, I um, pulled away from the uh, uh, from these uh, bullets, and um, uh, by simply just going into a hard right turn, I'd, I'd hardly uh, begun the turn when uh, I observed a MiG-15 fly straight underneath me. Um, my immediate impression was um, that this was too good an opportunity to miss, so I reversed and started to follow him. Follow him. Um, and I accelerated at the same time. Um, uh, when he was probably um, a couple of hundred yards in front, I started firing. And um, the he was still, uh, although I was, I was accelerating, he was still uh, moving away from me. But finally, uh, some of the bullets uh, obviously uh, hit his aircraft because uh, there was a, um, a large plume of smoke uh, uh, was emitted from around the fuselage area. And the next thing I saw was this aircraft sort of pitch up, obviously uh, out of control. And, um, uh, and as I was aware that there were other MiGs in the area, I, I rolled in. Uh, I rolled to the left and started into a into a you know a hard turn, uh, just to ensure that uh, there was nobody behind me. And uh, uh, as I went in, into the turn, the flight leader uh, observed uh, the pilot of the MiG uh, uh, to bail out. He ejected, and uh, his parachute deployed, and presumably um, he he landed safely. Meanwhile, we um, uh, our section of four aircraft uh, regrouped and uh, we uh, we continued um, flying there for another 10 or 15 minutes before we uh, redeployed uh, or flew back to the base. Um, the whole thing took maybe 30 seconds, but that's the nature of um, you know air combat these days. Uh, uh, sort of long sort of drawn out um, dog fighting is um, is something uh, you know that's that's that was sort of relegated to World War II really uh, with jet aircraft using so much fuel uh, unless it's uh, you know uh, you've got to get into it and out of it in a hurry otherwise you won't have enough fuel to get home. The squadron continued to suffer great losses with pilot officer Donald Robertson lost on the 15th of May whilst on a rocket mission. It was believed that the aircraft was hit by enemy ground fire whilst in a dive and exploded on contact with the ground. 
In July, Sergeant Kenneth Smith struck a small hill after making a strafing run whilst on an armed reconnaissance mission, his aircraft was seen to burst into flames and disintegrate. The following month, Flight Lieutenant Lance Haslope was also killed in a crash during takeoff on a rocket mission. On the afternoon of the 1st of September, two meteors departed in formation from Iwakuni, en route for K-14 in Korea, on a ferry flight. The aircraft became separated in heavy, turbulent cloud, both being thrown out of control. One crashed off the Japanese coast, killing both pilot officer Alan Avery and squadron engineer Flight Lieutenant Henry Johnston. The other meteor, flown by flying officer Randall Green, returned to Iwakuni severely damaged by hail and turbulence. Then, a month later, on the 2nd of October, flying officer Oliver Cruikshank, a RAF exchange pilot, was shot down in a surprise attack. A flight of four meteors had carried out a successful rocket strike and were returning to Kimpo when two MiGs jumped them from the 8 o'clock position. Sergeant Ken Murray received a 37mm hit in the port tailpipe during the MiG's first pass. He later observed Cruikshank bailing out over Chodo. Unfortunately, Cruikshank's parachute failed to open, and he fell into the sea with no chance of survival. The squadron returned to the fighter sweep role on the 13th of October, 1952, to set a record for any fighter unit of its size operating in Korea. The squadron flew a total of 80 sorties in one day, with only 22 serviceable aircraft. At this time, with the onset of the Korean winter, the squadron's maintenance personnel once again found their task increasingly more difficult. Sub-zero temperatures meant that fitters had to work with their gloves on at all times, as removing them for more than a few moments would invariably lead to frostbite. This made delicate operations all but impossible. Flight Lieutenant Frederick Lawrenson was hit by ground fire on the 24th of December, resulting in his starboard wing exploding and the aircraft crashing. He was not seen to eject. At the beginning of the new year, there was a change of leadership, with Wing Commander Jack Kininmont handing command to Wing Commander John Hubble on the 20th of January, 1953. Flying during the month was disrupted by continual bad weather, although a few successful strikes were carried out, with 50 enemy trucks and 48 buildings destroyed. The squadron lost one pilot during this month of atrocious weather. RAF pilot Flying Officer Francis Booth, who failed to return from an attack on two trains hidden in railway tunnels. Losses continued with Flight Sergeant John Halley failing to return from an armed reconnaissance mission on the 11th of February and was posted, missing, believed killed. Less than a month later, squadron leader Don Hillier failed to return from an armed reconnaissance mission and although extensive searches were carried out by other pilots, no trace of his aircraft or parachute could be found. Among the tragic stories of loss were also moments the pilots could look back at and laugh about. Here's Colin King recounting such an incident. On the 6th of March, <laughs> it's a terrible story. I suppose it would have been about my, my fourth or fifth mission. And... Uh, I was flying with a fellow by the name of Bill Percy, flight lieutenant, who was killed a few months later. Very nice chap. We were called upon, uh, probably at fairly short notice, to attack a gaggle of trucks, a column of trucks. I can't remember why there were just the two of us were sent out, but it was late in the day and I can only think that all the others were out already or were home and finished or to, to take too long to get hold of them. But they were able to get hold of us for some reason. And they told us where these trucks were and told us to get out and get them. Now, we, Bill Percy knew where they were, fortunately. Not quite sure why, but he did tell me. I know exactly where they are, Cole. Let's go. We took off. And I was formating on him down sun. So you know, I'm looking up into the sun and the glare was terrible. So I took out my dark glasses and put them on. That was much better. When we found our target, it was half past seven at night. And it was getting fairly duskish. And we were attacking in a valley 
and there was a lot of flak because what we were attacking were trucks full of troops and they were scattering like, it was like hitting an ant heap, they were scattering everywhere and of course they were all firing at us also, it was blink, blink, blink everywhere, but there was also tracer there, there was also heavy armament there and we were doing good high speed, probably the 600, 650 mile an hour and we're well spaced because if we went too close behind one another we could ricochets at least could shoot the other fellow down and uh, we were both having successful hits on these trucks but I was alarmed at the fact that here we are strafing at night it was I was quite dark and also I was not terribly used to this sort of thing and I probably came in a little bit steeper than I should have when I pulled out the aircraft kept going because of the momentum and this happened to quite a few people and by the time I actually pulled out I was looking up at telegraph poles, that's how low I was and um, finally uh, we both got hit, not badly, but we were hit a bit we didn't know at the time that we got back and finally we knocked off for want of fuel or maybe we were out of ammunition but we knocked off and headed home and now it was really dark and I started to wonder why I couldn't see the instruments very well. Mind you, I hadn't done a night landing in a meteor before and I turned up the lights and oh, gee whiz, it was dark and I could just see Bill Percy and, um, you know, the, the exhaust stubs of his engines and so forth and then he put on his lights and we got near base and I could see the the tail light, a crucifix tail, there's a light in the centre of that at the back and I followed that around the circuit and I was very grateful for it because I couldn't see the runway lighting because it was terribly dim being an airport, a war, war airport and it shrouded the lights, so you could really only see them properly when you're on the final approach. I followed him round and no, I got down alright, no problem but it seemed to me like a pretty dicey exercise and um, first night landing in a meteor, I thought, oh, gee, was a, I wouldn't want to do too much of this in bad weather. And we walked across the tarmac to talk to Bill. He said, Kingy, do you always fly at night with your dark glasses on? And that was uh, a very embarrassing moment. I said, well, thank goodness they don't issue clots medals in this squadron. <laughs> On the 16th of March, the squadron carried out what was arguably its most successful mission of the Korean War, having destroyed an enemy convoy of approximately 150 trucks. The convoy was first disabled at both ends, preventing any escape. The meteors then ran up and down the convoy length, rocketing and strafing. Realizing the enormity of the job at hand, the squadron requested USAF assistance. After six hours, the convoy was left in tatters. 77 Squadron alone accounted for the destruction of at least 24 vehicles and damage to an additional 74. The Meteors also strafed 35 troop billets, 10 supply stacks and two buildings. A message of congratulations was received from the Commanding General Far East Air Forces and as a result, the morale of the squadron soared to new heights. However, 10 days later, Sergeant Peter Chalmers lost his life when his aircraft was hit by ground fire and was seen to crash and explode after an attack on a truck. The next day, a flight of four meteors on an armed reconnaissance mission spotted a MiG chasing two USAF F-80 shooting star jets. Two more MiGs appeared as the meteors approached. In the engagement, Sergeant Dave Earlham received a major hit and had to break contact to nurse his jet back to Kimpo. Meanwhile, Sergeant George Hale fired a high explosive air to ground rocket between the two MiGs before engaging them with his cannons. Hale was credited with having probably shot down one of the MiGs, damaging another, and definitely scaring the daylights out of the two Chinese pilots. The next day, Flying Officer Taffy Rosser, RAF, lost contact after an attack on camouflage trucks. The remaining pilots circled the area, but could not see any sign of Rosser or his aircraft. At this time, Sergeant Ken Murray was posted back to Australia, having set a record by flying a total of 333 sorties during his two tours with the squadron. During the spring of 1953, 77 Squadron began night-armed reconnaissance missions with a good deal of success. 
coming into the wet season and adverse weather conditions saw sorties decline, and in June the squadron lost another pilot, Sergeant Desmond Nolan. The slowdown of activity did not last long. On the 15th of June, the squadron broke their own sortie record by flying 88 sorties in the one day over 90 hours and five minutes of flying time. Most of this effort was expended on enemy troop concentrations with 224 rockets being fired, destroying numerous vehicles, revetments and an enemy command post. The only 77 squadron casualty sustained during the raid was Sergeant Don Pinkstone, who was hit by anti-aircraft fire when attacking an enemy vehicle and was forced to bail out of his stricken jet. He parachuted safely, landing successfully in a nearby rice paddy. Other members of his flight saw Pinkstone fold up his parachute and run for the cover of some high ground near a small village. A rescue helicopter was called in, but was forced away from the downed pilot by intense enemy ground fire, leaving Pinkstone to be captured and interned as a prisoner of war. The 22nd of June, 1953, saw another successful ejection when RAF Flying Officer John Coleman was hit by ground fire but managed to bring the aircraft back to friendly lines and bailed out at 15,000 feet, later to be picked up by helicopter. We had one, one Brit while I was still there, uh, Coleman. He uh, had to bail out. He got hit. He got hit in the side somewhere and it jammed his controls uh, just north of the, uh, the line. He bailed out and the helicopters got him and he was back uh, not long after we sort of got out of the, out of the cockpit. And uh, there were blokes who'd bailed out in, in the water, still on the wing, and the choppers would, would pick them up because they, based, they had some islands on the coast where they based the rescue helicopters. Uh, one of the missions we used to do, in fact, was uh, capping a combat air patrol called capping, uh, we would fly above a bloke who'd uh, crashed or, or bailed out, and if uh, any troops came near him, we would, we would uh, attack them. Um, of course, we were getting shot at while we were up there, but um, you did uh, as much as was a reasonable risk uh, to rescue your pilots. They're very valuable assets. Squadron leader Len McGlinchey was killed on the 16th of July when his aircraft crashed and burned on takeoff. He had been detailed to participate in a rocket strike over North Korea. The war on the ground had stagnated into a stalemate, with neither side being able to gain the upper hand. The UN Air Forces had definite air superiority, but this alone could not win the war. An armistice signed at Panmunjom at 10.01 hours on the 27th of July, 1953, brought hostilities to a halt, with a ceasefire commencing shortly afterwards. The contribution made by 77 Squadron during the three years of the Korean War is totally out of proportion to that which might be expected from a unit of its size. During the war, the Squadron flew a total of 18,872 sorties, comprising of 3,872 Mustang and 15,000 Meteor flights. The squadron lost 41 personnel killed, including RAF pilots, all but two being due to an aircraft-related incident, and seven pilots captured. The squadron was credited with destroying 3,700 buildings, 1,500 vehicles, 16 bridges, 20 locomotives, 65 railway carriages, and an unknown number of enemy personnel. The outstanding results achieved by 77 Squadron, evidently much higher than usual for a single squadron, would not have been possible without the support provided by 391 Base Squadron and 491 Maintenance Squadron. The level of technical support was outstanding, resulting in close to 100% serviceability for the Mustangs and Meteors. To achieve this, maintenance crews often worked up to 16 hours per day under extremely harsh and often wet conditions. After the armistice agreement was signed, 77 Squadron stayed on in Korea, helping to maintain the United Nations presence.